All right, man, I got a great topic. We're going to talk about development of U.S. military firearms. Okay, so like the M16, right? Well, I mean, no, this is a cool gun, but it's definitely newer than this. I got you. I mean, okay, M4, that's newer, but no, it's it's not this. It's from, from H2K. Oh, 416. Uh, no, 416 is really cool, but no, this is going to be about the XM29 and the OICW program. everybody, welcome back to Classic Firearms. I'm Matt, and we're gonna go on another little history lesson where we learn how the US government has spent a ton of money trying to develop crazy and wacky replacements for the M16 rifle. So we've already talked about the SPIW program as well as the ACR program. This is a little bit later, so starting in about 1993, the government had the OICW program, which stands for Objective Individual Combat Weapon, uh, and again, you know, even though it started in 1993, the idea for it kind of started a little bit earlier in about 1986, where there was a report and it was kind of going over the conclusions of the ACR program. And what they basically said in the report was that, you know, individual small arms technology had kind of reached its peak, its zenith. And they weren't sure that we would be able to develop another ballistic or kinetic weapon that would be better at outperforming the M16. So what they thought of as a replacement idea was to issue individual soldiers a an explosive weapon. Um, so imagine something like a grenade launcher, but on a scale that every soldier was equipped with one. Uh, this isn't really a super new idea. Obviously, rifle grenades and things like that had been in existence for a while, but this would be uh, an, an experiment in replacing the main infantry armament with an explosive-based firearm uh, instead of just kinetic-based. Now. Uh, there was a program called CAWS, C-A-W-S, Close Assault Weapon, uh, that, that did experiment some with, uh, you know, a firearm that would come to be influential on the OICW program, which was H&K's CAWS uh, prototype, which was effectively like a bullpup shotgun. So in 1993, when they started developing the OICW program, uh, there were two contestants that kind of entered uh, submissions into this. AAI and Alliant Tech Systems, or ATK. Now, both of these were actually representing groups of developers. So as an example, AAI represented a group that included people like FN, and ATK represented a group that included H and K. So I might say H and K, I might say AT, ATK, and just keep in mind that both of those refer to the same group that were developing the XM29. So. Of the two submissions, the Army heavily seemed to side with the ATK group, and that is the one that they really went into for the next almost decade of development. So the, the program was kind of interesting because we're really talking about a kind of compound weapon system. What the Army wanted was to, to be a overmounted grenade launcher that was magazine fed with an underslung you know, point direct kind of a uh, firearm, or they call it a kinetic energy uh, weapon, which is just a normal rifle. Uh, normally when we might think back to, you know, how M16s or, or M4s are set up, you might think of like the M203 grenade launcher, which is underslung underneath the rifle. This just kind of inverts that idea. We're gonna have the primary firearm be the grenade launcher on top, and then underslung there will be a shorter, you know, rifle that is kind of a secondary, just immediate defense weapon. So the XM29 uh, was developed and it was interesting because they had the ability to separate these two devices and for them to operate independently. Uh, you could have a detachable stock that would be able to mount to the firearm portion of it, which is developed off of the G36 from H&K. So it's a plastic chassis uh, rifle. And then you could also attach a separate fire control unit to the grenade launcher side of things. So you could use either of these things as an independent kind of firearm, uh, depending on how your mission was configured. If you were gonna go into a building where that grenade launcher was not gonna be doing you any favors, then certainly you could just go in with a very short and lightweight rifle. Uh, on the other hand, if you were going to be, you know, up on a, on a hill or something and you were only gonna be there in a support capacity, you could dispense with the extra weight of the rifle portion and just have the grenade launcher. Now, it was a very, very, very complicated, sophisticated, 
system because they had what effectively was a ballistic computer attached to the top of this so that you could actually use a laser range finder, find the exact range for your target, and then it would program the, uh, the grenade, depending on what setting you had it in, to airburst. And the concept was that we would be more effective at engaging enemy combatants by being able to fire over uh, cover and concealment, or if there was some kind of, uh, you know, you were, had enemies that were in fog or smoke or something like that, that instead of having to hit the ground or something else hard to detonate, that this could be, you know, grenade could be programmed to explode after a certain distance and do so at, you know, three to six feet where it would have a full effect. You'd have full 360 degrees of explosion um, and be able to engage those targets that you might not be able to with a conventional rifle. Now, there was also a setting where you have, where it would just be a explosion on impact. So you would be able to fire directly at a target. So say you had an armored vehicle or something, uh, you know, you could set it for direct fire or this air burst capability. The scope had to calculate the distance and it would help you with sighting in on, you know, where your target was gonna be. And then you could also manually adjust the explosion distance by a couple meters plus or minus. So like, let's say you see someone run behind a wall. If you laser the wall, well, the person's behind that. So you actually can add a meter or two so that when you fire just over the wall, it will go just past it before detonating. Um, and similarly, if something was advancing on you, you'd be able to laze the distance to that and then subtract a couple meters to make up for the progress they're making as the grenade is flying through the air. Now, this all sounds really cool. Like you can certainly imagine a situation in which having this compound firearm would just make every soldier a wrecking crew. You know, your primary armament is a, a grenade that explodes, a high explosive. Um, also, they could be you know issued with armor piercing grenades, and, and just you know definitely super effective on the battlefield. But there was definitely some shortfallings when it came to the XM29, because first off, it didn't hit any of the project's requirements on weight or cost. Uh, so we were talking about a system that at its kind of lightest was like 18 pounds. And with once you added all the ammunition and things, uh, the sights, the, you know, all of the extra accessories and, and support that you would need to operate that, you know, you're actually looking at well over that, putting it way, way, way heavier than a, an equivalent, you know, M16, even with the loadout that you'd be carrying for that. Uh, also, they were much more expensive. Although, you know, the figures I saw did say that while, you know, it was much more expensive to produce than an M16, given the fact that they were including these things like the ballistic computer scope uh, with night vision, infrared capability. Uh, it, it wasn't really out of the ballpark compared to once you fitted all these kind of extra electrical accessories uh, to a normal M16 or M4. When you think of like, you know, having a, a D-ball unit and, you know, night vision, uh, your optic, all that kind of things, it wasn't really that much more expensive. Um, so yeah, so having failed to meet those criteria, there were also operational or performance shortcomings. So they had gone to a 20 millimeter grenade uh, for the main armament, and they found that it just didn't really have the expected lethality on targets that they had really hoped it would. Um, also, due to the fact that you are effectively just attaching a very short rifle to the bottom of this, uh, the barrel length on it was only 9.8 inches, and with 5.56 ammunition, they were shooting M855. You really just did not get the ballistic performance you needed to for you know effective use downrange. Uh, you know, so certainly out to two or 300 yards, you were still expected to use the rifle uh, instead of the grenade launcher, and you were just not getting a lot of performance out of such a short barrel. So what the military did was they decided that they were going to branch this into two separate kind of sub projects. Uh, where one would develop a rifle family system and the other would develop just a grenade launcher. And these would be utilized on their own with the proposed kind of step three of going back and trying to reincorporate once they had kind of worked out the bugs. So we never get to step three, the, the reincorporation of the XM29 never really happens uh, because the project is canceled during phase one and phase two, which are happening kind of concurrently for the rifle system, as well as the grenade launcher system. Uh, the rifle system is really cool. Uh, you know, it is developed into the XM8, which again is kind of uh, based off of the G36, 
but it's a very HK style, full plastic chassis. It is super configurable. The idea was that you could take this one basic chassis and configure it as a PDW style close carbine. Uh, you could configure it as a carbine, so your kind of standard issue implement. Uh, and then you could also do it as a direct marksmanship kind of model or a light machine gun. So, you know, we go from like nine inches of barrel for the PDW up to, I think it was 12 and a half inches for the carbine. So still a fairly short carbine barrel. Um, and then we jump way up there. It's like 18 inches for the direct, uh, the designated marksman and 20 inches for the machine gun. So, you know, certainly the idea of being able to have a end user reconfigure this uh, so that your one rifle can serve multiple different kind of uh, purposes within the unit is a really interesting idea. And I think that, you know, with the modularity uh, of modern firearms, it's an achievable goal. Um, now, they also, in even though the, the grenade launcher was going to be a separate program for a, a self-contained grenade launcher, they did develop a new grenade launcher that would work with the XM8 family of rifles, which is the M320. And the M320 does get developed into a replacement for the M203 grenade launcher. Uh, you know, it's fairly similar in size, weight, and in fact, it, it loads from the side as opposed to the rear. But, uh, you know, that actually does, that portion of this development of, in the project does actually get adopted. Uh, one thing I think is really interesting is that, you know, before they standardized on the design that they were looking for for the XM29, there is actually a couple different experiments. So another thing that we see has gone on to successfully be implemented into service in different places is the MP7. So rather than using a rifle based off of the G36, there was also some experimentation with mounting the grenade launcher on a MP7 style uh, firearm. So, you know, it's in that 4.6 caliber uh, designed to defeat some of the soft body armor that had been developed. And it's more of a submachine gun style firearm. But, uh, it, I, you know, in a certain way, when you consider, again, that if you were supposed to rely on the grenade launcher, uh, this was just more of a, a personal defense firearm uh, that was part of the, the uh, compound firearm system. Uh, it kind of makes sense that you would use something like that uh, because you're not being expected to really shoot out to range. But of course, by itself, the MP7 has been adopted all around the world by different agencies and uh, organizations. So that's another thing that came around right in this time frame, uh, right around 1999, I believe. Uh, now, separately, Phase 2 was going on concurrently with Phase 1, where they were developing this rifle series. And Phase 2 focused on just a self-contained uh, grenade launcher. And they developed the XM25 kind of airburst uh, system, uh, which is sometimes called the Predator. Uh, so this was a, a very interesting system. I, they went up to a 25 millimeter grenade. It was much more effective than the old 20 millimeter grenades that they had used in the original XM29. But again, things like weight and cost simply just could not seem to be overcome. Uh, we're talking about a very heavy independent system, so much so that you know, you replaced your normal service rifle with the carrying of this. You only could carry a standard loadout of 36 rounds. And basically when it was, you know, introduced as a possible, uh, you know, field test in around 2005, people just simply did not want to use it. They didn't want to lose a rifleman in order to have somebody carrying this thing, uh, even though it was much more effective uh, at, at doing its job than the M203. Uh, so, you know, the distances that you could engage out to was much farther. It was up to 700 yards and you could do so much more accurately because again, it had that kind of a ballistic computer that would help you with calculating when and uh, uh, where to aim to, to really be able to drop those rounds on target, as well as that programmability of the projectile. So you could you know, have the option to have it hit directly or explode in the air and add or, or subtract distance. So it was a very effective grenade launcher, but simply due to the fact that it was not something you could use along with your rifle, you had to just replace your service rifle. Um, it was not popular and both phase one and phase two were effectively ended, uh, you know, around 2005. There were some field tests for the XM25 that continued on. And I believe that that actually wasn't completely terminated all the way until 2017. So there was actually quite a, a good long period of testing. Now, uh, you know, when the government did announce they were going to develop that rifle for phase one, uh, 
there was some complaints from the firearm industry that because of how drastically uh, it, the requirements had changed from the original specifications to this kind of phase one specifications, that they should reopen it for further competition. You know, we're no longer developing the thing that ATK developed. We're now developing a new rifle, and so we should hold new trials. And I did see some evidence that uh, some people did develop uh, competitors. Uh, so there was a Colt system that was designed, uh, again, to be modular, where you could uh, change it from different configurations for depending on its point of use, from a machine gun to a carbine to like a PDW. Uh, it was really cool because the Colt system utilized a monolithic upper that had you know upper and rail all as one piece. And the only real change to the lower had to come uh, with the machine gun, uh, the light machine gun segment of it. So it was interesting that they were really trying to go for this commonality of parts. But ultimately, uh, you know, it seemed that the military still focused on the ATK submission for that phase one project. Um, although it did test it against several other firearms, including like the HK416. Uh, so, you know, the, and the M4. So some of that testing actually was thrown out by the military because when they were looking at uh, its its operational ability, uh, they found that the M4 experienced so many more stoppages. And what I mean by that is, you know, they're testing for adverse conditions and operation under adverse conditions. So they will shoot an extended period, uh, you know, tens of thousands of rounds. And they will count how many times the firearm malfunctions, like a failure to feed, failure to eject, failure to extract, something that stops the operation of the weapon within that period. Uh, so the XM8 did very well, uh, the HK416 uh, and some of the other competitors did well. But then when we got to the, to the M4, it had almost twice as many stoppages as the next participant in that trial. So much so that when they looked at it, they said, we think that there has to have been something different in the conditions or judging of this competition. And so, because uh, it, it, it dwarfed even previous tests with the M4. So it was kind of interesting that they've effectively looked at it and said, we don't think that the conditions of the testing were fair and it ended up excluding that. So, I mean, like all of these programs, uh, the conclusion effectively was that these, these funding for these programs was cut and there was no real change, although certainly parts of it were used in other ways. So the M16 continued to serve uh, and, and the M4, because again, we're talking about that early 2000s period by the end of this. Uh, so, you know, we see that even the Marine Corps, you know, by this point is, is starting to adopt the M4 in places. Uh, but, you know, the, the AR platform has been continued to be utilized by the military. Uh, none of these new weapon systems are adopted as they are. Um, although, you know, again, parts of it like the MP7 or the M320 grenade launcher do continue to be utilized. So we've got a, a very large expenditure of funds uh, without really a, a very satisfactory kind of conclusion to see that that was worth it uh, in the end. Uh, but yeah, you know, there are, are plenty of other programs. It seems like as soon as we develop a system, you know, we always want to be chasing that next advantage. So as soon as we develop a system, we're looking for ways to replace it, make it better. And so certainly I think that that's a driving force in American commerce as well as the military. Um, and it gets us some of the things that we're able to enjoy nowadays when it comes to modern firearms as well uh, as, as citizens. Uh, but yeah, the, the OICW program, uh, again, lasted about 10 years. Didn't really have a satisfactory conclusion for the testing of the new firearms, but you know, who knows? Maybe something that get, does get developed in one of these programs will revolutionize the industry. Uh, and you can never tell until you try. You know, you definitely put your effort into it with all the advancements in materials, engineering, uh, explosives, chemistry. All of these things coalesce to kind of maybe we'll find that magic key, right? Uh, and of course, we did just recently adopt the Sig Spear as a replacement uh, for the M16 family. But, uh, but yeah, you know, that was the OICW program. So if there's another topic in history that you think you'd like us to cover, please feel free to leave it down in the comment section below. I'm happy to, you know, try to find out uh, as much as I can about all kinds of new topics that I don't know about and then be able to maybe have a conversation with you guys. Uh, don't forget, if you haven't yet, go to cfcontest.com because there's always fun stuff going on over there and it changes. So make sure you're coming back, you know, occasionally. Uh, there's always new stuff going on. So definitely check that out as well. Guys, again, I appreciate your time. If there's other topics or other conversations you'd like us to have, again, make sure you let us know. But until next time, we'll see you then.